one of the most popular players in CSGO, understandably so, as you'll see as I kind of talk about this guy now, is Taz, the player for Virtus Pro, the Polish team, and he's sometimes the in-game leader of their team. And people know him as a personality in CSGO. They've seen his team when they won the major, EMS won Katowice, and they know him from his team, like in general. Now he's even becoming a streaming figure, apparently. So people probably know his personality quite well. I think they know a little bit about his game, but maybe they wonder a bit more about who is he and what, what kind of made him who he is today and where did he come from over all did he play in the past and how does he fit into CS history and so that's what I'm going to talk about now so let's go way back in time let's get in the time machine if we go back to like 2003 this sort of era Taz was one of the best Polish players actually individually he was playing on one of the best teams and crucially he was always in a rival team to Neo Neo now is the greatest player player of all time in my opinion in CS 1.6 he was just the best he was the god but back then he was just a good Polish player not many people outside of the Polish region or the Central Europe really knew much about any of these players but within Poland they were always battling each other these two teams and what they came to the realization of at some point was we got to put this rivalry aside like if Poland's ever going to have a really good team we need a super team like that's the, if we want to go and beat these other teams from abroad because at the time Poland wasn't anything comparative to the rest of Europe it wasn't it wasn't even close to having a team that could ever even make a big splash at a big tournament so they made this team Pentagram and in Pentagram it took a couple of years where they were having like decent like upset results and some smaller lands until eventually in 2006 they got this like this golden five lineup together that would able go on to win majors and in this team, Taz was mainly known just as the in-game leader. He was like a decent player, sort of like average for top level pros. It's not like he wasn't close to the level of like a forest type guy. He was just a, a good pro. In his team, Neo was the star. And then the others were all sort of like a mixture. They were all just okay, the others. And Neo was really the star that stood out. And at this time, 2006, 2007, 2008, individual players could have a huge impact on the game. Like the level of the average pro wasn't close to the gods of like Forrest, Neo, Zet. These guys could like, they really could 1v5 the whole game to a degree and dominate. And so you could have a star like that. And as long as the rest of the team worked around with tactics and team play and having good maps and synergy communication, then you really could just have one guy carry the whole game to a degree, let's not go too far. So at the time, Taz was mainly just known as the in-game leader and he started to be known for his personality in as much as back in those days, a lot of pro players, media wasn't as big a deal in being a pro gamer back then. So as a result, a lot of teams, especially foreign language teams, like teams in Sweden or Poland, Germany, some of the players also weren't comfortable speaking English. So a lot of them would assign, like one player it would, either would directly be assigned as the captain or it'd just become his job from doing it a lot, where he was the most outgoing, gregarious guy and he'd do the interviews. So in, in Fnatic, it was always Khan. You never saw Forrest doing interviews. When it was in this team, it was nearly always Taz, Maybe every now and then Cuban might do one or two, but his English wasn't as close as it was good as Taz's. You'd never see Neo doing them initially. So it was, that's how we knew Taz, the in-game leader. And he's the guy who's the face of the team in terms of interviews in English. As a player going on in that team, eventually he would swap leadership sometimes with Cuban, who would sometimes do it. And the difference is Taz was more of a free-for-all style, just calling looser, whereas Cuban was more like a bit of set tactics, a bit of trying to read the opponents. And so it was slightly different, but overall the team's strengths would actually remain quite similar depending on who it was. The key thing was what it what would affect in terms of Taz's game or Cuban game individually, depending on if they were the in-game leader. In terms of the overall pentagram style, especially the style that Taz brought, it was like a loose approach. It was like aggressive T-side play. They were famous for being able to get seven, eight rounds on maps like Nuke and Train, which were very CT-sided maps. These were maps where the really good teams were almost guaranteed to get 11 or 12 rounds on CT. So if you could get six or seven or a seven or eight as T-side against the best teams in the world, you were a godlike T-side team. Now, admittedly, they had these godlike T-side halves. The CT halves were a little bit weaker than those elite level teams, the Swedish teams, the Fnatic's, the SKs. But overall, it worked out for them. Their style in general, this is where Taz comes into it, is because it was loose, it was kind of an intuitive style. They had really good chemistry, really good synergy. It really was a golden lineup. There was something special about this lineup. I'd compare them, if you're a League of Legends fan, to the Moscow 5 lineup that was so very good in League of Legends, where it wasn't like consciously designed and in great communication between everyone. There was an intuitive quality to it that was amazing. And you could see it in this team, particularly when they got into like 2 on 2 situations or 2 on 3 or 3 on 1, but 
well, not three on one because it wouldn't really work with their three on two the other way around. Like these are the situations where they worked their best in, but it's like people just somehow played off each other well and they knew each other. And crucially, they kept the lineup together for a while, so that just got better and better and better over the years. Now, at the time, Taz was known as an aggressive player. He was the guy who would run in first with the AK and he'd entry frag even. And he'd, he'd, just, he'd like to just get in there, close the distance, shoot mid range to close range with the AK spray. He had pretty good spray control. And that's how he would try and get his kills and he'd have the ball. He basically had, it was a ballsy style of play. There was actually some positions that Taz was quite famous for. Like in the history of CS, this might surprise you. Since like I said, he wasn't a star for a lot of 1.6. Taz is easily the best player in the history of CS 1.6 at playing a very specific position, which is in on nuke. A CT, when you play in the upper bomb site in 1.6, there's the yellow hut that people come out of and the squeaky doors on the other side of it. A style of play there is you either play up from the rafters or on the ground usually. But some players would play on top of the yellow hut. So you could stand on there and shoot people as they come out the squeaky or as they come out the front, like sort of open door of the yellow hut. And the trick to playing this position well, if you chose to play it, was you had to be really good at timing when to look either side. And they can also come in the mini entrance. And also, crucially, when to drop down and shoot people inside the hut. Now, Taz is by far the best player ever at playing this position. He just had an incredible intuitive sense of when to drop down. So as a result, if you ever go and look up old frag movies of Hibbs, there's so many clips of him doing that. And plus, that was the perfect close range for his sort of close to medium range, full on, full auto spray style that he embraced. So that particular position, he's very famous for. Another one he was very good at was actually the lower inner ramp on train where it's a really close range position. And again, you have to really time when you peek. So if you peek up and you get killed easily, you might have just given the whole site up and they'll easily get a plant down in there. So this is something that Taz was quite famed for in, in terms of style. Now then, as the years wore on, he actually did get to become sort of a star player. Because in 2010 and onwards, it was mainly about Cuban being the in-game leader. This was the main focus. And so when this happened, it freed up a lot of Taz's individual game. And what's interesting was he really did become, this, by far, the second best player in the team. Neo, no, he wasn't close to Neo because Neo really was like... The, I mean, for people who are CSGO fans now, you're going to have to think of Neo like you think of Kenny S right now. The way he's playing right now, dominating every game like that. Thinking of when Get Right in the early CSGO was just the god untouchable. When Shocks at the end of 2013 had that incredible stretch. These sorts of mega peaks is what Neo was like for years at a time. He'd just have tournaments where he was like the best player. Like, best player at this tournament. Second best at this one. Best at this one. Third best at this one. First, His consistency in high level play was unreal. So, he, Taz wasn't at that level. But he was clearly the second best. He was a very, he was a, If you took out the gods, he was right in the next tier. He was in tier two of top players. He was doing really well in 2010, 2011, 2012. He was having a really great set of years his skills were having a great game impact he was able to back up neo so that in these eras when you did need a bit more firepower a lot of the teams like fanatic and navi had a lot more star players taz was able to play that role to some degree of these and one of the key qualities of taz when he became this individual player was he had a lot of heart he was really competitive to me in these latter years 2010 and 2012 the two players who had the most heart, who were the most competitive at all times, were Taz and Get Right. These two players just never gave up. They always believed they could do it. Even when they were losing, they had they had that sort of like never give up attitude where they would keep fighting back. They never got dejected, never got depressed in that sense. And so you look at Taz's career, and yes, part of it's playing with Neo like a godlike player, but and this special lineup and a lot of happenstance of getting that and then being able to keep it together and the problems. Because that's the thing, their team used to fight a lot. And in general, Taz has been a guy who, to some degree, listen, if you know, nearly all of the players in that team were part of the fighting and contributed with their own personalities and the clashing aspects and getting annoyed at this guy and getting sick of this guy. But to a degree, he was more of a cohesive guy who tried to bring some aspects together, even if he, at times he, he played his own role in some of the problems, frictions within the team. But what they were able to accomplish was incredible because this team... Over their whole history, with the one roster change overall, in terms of a long scale one, they had a small one briefly where they took Cuban out and he came back. But in terms of one big roster change when they got Pasha and they got rid of Luke, this team overall was willing was able to win six or seven majors, depending on how you define them, the particular majors. Because I actually have a qualm on that that some people don't really agree with, where they were able to win three WCG gold medals. They were able to win the IEM title twice. See, that's where I count one of them is. Um, I, I don't really count one anyway. But they, they were able to win two, and they were able to win ESWC twice as well. So they were able to win, by some people's count, seven majors. Now, just to put that in context, after people like Taz and Neo was seven, 
you go down and okay potty one of the greatest players in the early days he won five okay that's great the navi players they won four majors Let's go now to someone else. The the guy that people always put up with Neo is the other greatest player of all time on 1.6, Forrest. Forrest won three. Get right, won two. So you can see the level that above, in terms of just winning majors, in terms of consistency, these teams have a problem. But just winning majors, Taz's resume is fucking amazing. So you've got to give a lot of credit. And that, that plays to the aspects of, I told you, a lot of heart, a ballsy style, knowing what your style is and playing to that style. Now you come out of 1.6, you come into CSGO, and crucially, they kept their latter day lineup together. The lineup that in the beginning of 2012 had been able to win another major, IEM World Championship. They kept it early on in CSGO and they tried to keep it for like a year or so. Yeah, I'd say roughly about a year. And it, it didn't go that well. Like they were okay. They were usually hovering around like fourth or fifth best team for most of 2012 and 2013 when you looked at the overall results, but they weren't really convincing. Like really. Aside from like one or two maps early, they weren't going to ever beat Nip. They were unlikely they were even going to beat Avery Games. They had problems. They lost to Quantic at the ESEA LAN. Yeah, they had some issues overall. They were a good team, but it was clearly they weren't close to the level of the team that could win the majors as they had in 1.6. And so they had to change players. Now, crucially, in this era, Taz, initially, people might not realize this who didn't follow early CSGO, was the best player in this team by far. He was the most consistent. He had the most game impact. He was able to get his kills. He was able to have like big rounds. So actually, what's funny is I thought, oh, he's carried that over from 1.6. He's going to be really good. It was Neil that was the one who dropped off a lot. Now then, the end of 2013, when they got this new lineup in ESC, which was the same lineup that they have now in Virtus Pro, they got Bialy, they got Snacks. This point in time was really poor for Taz. It was poor for everyone. They dropped off really badly. They bombed out of the group stage in the first major. Next year, they came back. They managed to win EMS 1 and Katowice in incredible fashion. One of the most dominant runs of all time in CSGO. A really impressive win. But actually what's weird is they won that. And I would say, looking when I remember back and looking at some of the games, I think Taz was the worst player in that team on that particular run. In fact, what's weird is I remember Neo carrying this team to all the titles. And then Taz was like his second gun in for some of them towards the end. He was like the second star. And yet Taz and Neo, to, to a big degree, got carried to this title. So it wasn't really the same as when they won the majors before to me. That's what's weird is Taz's level, even since then, has always seemed to be a bit problematic. It's always been, if I'm being honest, for top pros, the top for the, how good his team is, like a top three or four in the world, his level's always been a bit below average for the other pros at that level and sometimes quite bad, actually. Now then, some of that has been he's been taking turns as the in-game leader, then he's been swapping it away again. They've had to give more star power roles to people like Bialy, Pasha, Snacks. There's a degree to which people always wonder, I've always wondered this as well, they've, they've had something like three or four in-game leaders in this team. Why do they always have in-game leaders? On paper, I actually think that Taz probably is the best in-game leader they've had. But he once told me this, this kind of like, explain this sort of concept to me. He said it like jokingly, but I could tell he sort of meant it truthfully as well, which is that, because of like the blunt style of how those players talk to each other and just their cultural heritage, they will have arguments if they have the same in-game leader and they have a bad spell of tournaments. And so he's almost like figured out the formula from his time in these teams to not ever get kicked from the team. And the idea is you do it like three or four tournaments and then once things have gone badly for like a couple, you're like, okay, uh, someone else take a turn as the in-game leader. Now, you know, we need it for to keep the team fresh and all that. And that's the way that you don't ever run into the problem with them just kicking you out completely but then things will go back have a little spike again where the, you've got the honeymoon period of another in-game leader then if things go badly again right now Taz can take over again for a while he can set things up he can set things. so I kind of understand this concept it's true that he has managed to pick his form up over the last couple of months of 2014 the last couple of events he got it going a bit like crucially I remember map one with the stand-in against LDLC at Fragbite Masters in the upper final he was awesome on overpass. He was like, dominant. He had a really awesome game. But after that, yeah, he, got, he like the rest of his team, he got crashed in the next two maps. At DreamHack Winter, he was okay. He had some. He had a couple of halves where he got things going. In general, his team was good and they were at the level to potentially win the event. But obviously, they had that big collapse in the semifinals. So as a player, yeah, it's kind of not been so good in, as in CSGO because his best periods were early on when the team wasn't good. And then his worst periods have actually been when the team was at its best. So I think he's still got something he hasn't figured out in terms of role, or maybe he can't get the kind of role that he wants and would have had in 1.6 when he was like close to star level. In terms of personality, which is obviously the thing that jumps off the page about Taz. First of all, he's a really competitive guy. Like I said, in terms of heart, in terms of being a gamer, like always wanting to be in the game. 
And a way that that is reflected is in the way he trash talks in the game. This isn't something new. He's been doing this for years. At any tournaments where they would put PCs so you could hear someone if they shouted, he would shout trash talk. And it would always be the sort of trash talk of like, he'd kill someone and then he'd shout something like, get, get right, D does your mouse work? Just stuff that like, isn't even really a proper thing that would annoy you on the surface, but just the tone of it and just to, to someone who asks you that when you're trying to pretend like you don't hear them and you're trying to block them out, that's just annoying. And it's actually good in that sense. It would psychologically get in people's fucking heads and it would annoy them and piss them off. And they'd be, and the whole, crucially, it didn't matter if you talk trash back to Taz. Like, that's the thing. He was immune from it. It didn't, it didn't seem to affect him. I've never seen him get mad because of someone talking trash to him. I've seen him get mad when his team wasn't doing what they should do or someone's fucking up and not like playing like they're not totally into it. He's he got mad in those situations. But I've never seen him get mad from trash talk back. In fact, What's funny is that ESWC 2011, they played in this third place game versus Mouse Sports, the German team. And I remember he was talking all this trash to everyone. Roman, he was talking to Zonic, Zonix, this, this young player they had. Just everyone talking mad shit to them. And what's funny is I remember there was a round where he'd been talking some shit. And so then this Zonix guy actually managed to kill him. And the Zonix guy shouts something over like, Hey Taz! What about that man? Or something like that. And then what's funny is because Taz has been talking all this shit, you'd think he'd just be like, yeah, whatever. But he actually was just like, oh, okay, fair play. You got me that time. And I was like, what? <laughs> That's actually pretty cool. He's like talking shit, but he can take it back. He's like, it's not in a spiteful way, you know? And so in terms of within his team, I'll let you into a little bit of kind of how I see Taz. And this is what's funny is, listen, I guarantee you he'll watch this video and he'll probably get mad at this part, but I don't give a fuck. I'm just going to let you guys into the world a little bit so you can get a sense. Taz, I, I speculate, Taz thinks of himself as the general. He's the guy where he's going to lead his guys into battle and listen, follow me, guys. And he wants to give like that epic, you know, that fucking speech that you'd give in the movie where you'd be like, guys, follow me and we will win today. This will be the best. Like, you know, that sort of epic, like raising the level. And then you all go out and you go to war or you go and play the match that you win. He, that's who he wants to be. That's who he imagines himself to be sometimes. Sometimes I think it probably works because they've had these epic runs and in huge tournaments. Sometimes I get the sense that that works less well than he thinks it does in his own mind. That's my read at least. But as a result, thinks of himself as a vocal leader. Part of this, part of why he likes this style and why he's done interviews all these times, I'll say this in the most affectionate way possible, but just to, for the sake of being funny, I'm going to phrase it like this. Taz is also an attention whore. And listen, what's funny is, as soon as I say that, if he's watching this video now, he'll be like, this is bullshit, what is he saying? That is totally true, and he knows it's true. Deep down, he knows it's true. He loves to do interviews, he loves to be on camera, he loves to play up for the camera, he loves to be the star, he loves to, people to think of him as a funny guy. And by the way, he has all these things, he's a funny guy, he's a great on-camera personality. He's obviously loves, he's great in interviews, he gives you quotables. Now, that's another factor about Taz. I know, listen, I know this, mate, because I, I have the same quality myself. He's a big mouth as well. So in certain situations, he will say things before he's entirely thought of it. Or crucially, he'll just make something up on the spot. It might sound profound. It might sound like something he really believes, he's really thought about. But actually, he just made it up at the time. And it's a funny, it might, might just be because it's a funny line or it's an epic line or it sounds cool to him. But as a result, don't take everything he says as gospel. Like, oh, that must be totally true. And that's exactly what they were thinking. And that's all. Listen, it might be cool, but sometimes it might just be something that he just came up with on the spot. That's just kind of his personality. And so... I think I've given you some insight into his playing style, his history, his personality there. That's Taz. And so if you like, listen, I'm not surprised he's a streamer. He'd probably make a really good streamer. I've always thought because of his tenure and his pedigree and all the titles he's won, and within his team, a lot of them for a while at least didn't speak much English or didn't couldn't really communicate with the Western world. And crucially, their, their, their star, Neo, was like a really reserved sort of personality. It was actually very good to have Taz. I always thought he was a good ambassador for the game. Kind of the guy where if you if you wanted esports to get big and have superstar names and on-camera guys, Taz is someone you'd pick. He's one of those guys who's a natural born star in that sense.